to uh, thank a couple of my staff for uh, helping with this, particularly Ann Beatty for coordinating with the school, Ann and Trevor Sanday for some of the logistics and putting all of this together to make it possible, um, and Trevor and Tom Beatty also for creating the display of archival materials, which if you've, if you've not seen them yet, please take some time uh, after the panel discussion to take a look at them. Uh, the materials drawn from our collections, uh, and quite frankly, some things that I have not seen. So you know, I'm very pleased that we are able to present these materials pertaining to World War I uh, and as they relate to this panel discussion. Well, that's enough for me. Let's get started with the show, so to speak. And I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Chris Nichols, who will uh, provide some insight into the discussion this afternoon as well as introduce the panelists. So, Chris, take over. All right, so uh, I have the great honor and pleasure of introducing my co-panelists, who are also colleagues and friends, um, and talk a little bit about our format. Um, so first off, each of us will speak for roughly 10 minutes. Everybody's really afraid of me. Uh, to threaten them, uh, some too many panels go along. We want to talk to you guys about perspectives on local level. We don't want to just uh, have this be us monologuing and lecturing. Um, so I have to hold myself accountable too. Let's see if I can do that. Um, we're, uh, so each of us will speak in turn for 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll briefly sort of see if we can make some connections and maybe uh, even artificially find some tension between the four of us about our different disciplinary kind of models and, and uh, research interests. Uh, and then we'll open it up to you all. We'll be here until 5.15 uh, and then close it down, but we've got these archival materials and a little bit of food, so please feel free to linger afterwards to continue the conversation. Uh, so as I said, I'm uh, Christopher McKnight Nichols. I'm an historian here, among other things. Uh, I'm the author of a book called Promise and Peril, America the Dawn of the Global Age, and senior editor of the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Military and Diplomatic History. And when you edit an encyclopedia, it's always good to bring at least one volume of it to prove that you actually know something. <laughs> World War I or something. All right, so now I've got to give myself only 10 minutes. Uh, so I've taken as my topic the global, some of the global dynamics of the world. Uh, on my lapel is a poppy pin to commemorate World War I. Several people, uh, Joseph, Jerry Clough, have taken some of the ones that I brought along here too. Uh, if you spent any time in England recently, you may have seen these poppy pins. Uh, and this is a long going uh, tradition. Uh, if you spend time in Canada, you've seen these poppy pins. Um, this one is from the Royal British Legion, and it contains a few moving lines from the Ode of Remembrance, which is taken from Lawrence Binion's poem, For the Fallen, as follows on this one. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn them. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we shall remember. All right, so the Remembrance poppy has been used since the war, actually starting in 1920 or 1921, to commemorate soldiers who died in war. It's inspired in part also by the poem, uh, the World War I poem in Flanders Field, written famously by Canadian doctor, Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae. Um, but they were first used by Americans, actually. It was the American Legion who started using pop. I know. Uh, uh, to commemorate American soldiers who died in the war. They were then adopted by particularly British uh, militant, uh, military veterans groups uh, to make claims for uh, higher pensions and for so-called poppy appeals uh, for their troops. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, they're, though they're mainly used across the UK uh, to commemorate their service men and women. Small artificial poppies are often worn on clothing for a few weeks prior to Remembrance Day, November 11th, next Tuesday. And poppy wreaths are also often laid at war memorials. In the weeks leading up to the so-called Remembrance Sunday, the Sunday before Armistice Day or Veterans Day, millions of red poppy pins, brooches, and commemorative items um, distributed by the Royal British Legion, among others, in return for donations for their poppy appeal, appear all over the place. And you see this in British Premier League soccer, for example. You see it in a classic sort of soccer hooligan. So it's on, their, on jerseys, on scarves. Right? So what accounts for this? Um, some observers and critics actually made the accusation that it's items like this from wartime that reinforce a kind of hyper-patriotic memorialization of and reification of war, of war making. Right? That these sorts of things, the gestures, the things in the American context, flag hands after 9-11, are the, exactly the sorts of things that actually underscore war making. And, and at the same time, others would say this is all about collective sacrifice, remembrance, commemoration. Now, we could debate that. Um, but the point here, for me, isn't about so much about this 
uh, what, what some uh, would argue uh, is the sacralized or national or local historical accounts, um, but rather about the ways in which different states uh, commemorate um, the same sorts of events. Uh, the different peoples and groups commemorate the same sorts of events. Um, while Americans are noticeably under-informed about World War I, the endurance of worldwide remembrances of the war, like poppy pins, from England to France and from India to, to Japan, we can find these sorts of things all over the world, are indicative, I think, of something profound about the conflict, about how it reshapes the world. Virtually everything that happened in the remainder of the century after World War I was, in one way or another, I would argue, a consequence of, or maybe more precisely, an outcome generated by World War I. Okay, that's a highly uh, contestable statement, but I'm going to toss that We're out. We're working on right now. Right? Fair enough. And that's what the discussion is. Uh, to name just a few of these consequences, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the Great Depression, World War II, the Holocaust, the development and use of the atomic bomb, the Cold War, the collapse of European colonialism, the rise of nationalist movements in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Central, and South America. We could go on, but the reshaping effects of World War I. First of all, thinking about the global elements, it was fought uh, and rapidly came to be seen as a world war, the Great War. Nobody knew that there was another war coming. And this is what, all, what much of the interwar pacifists were fighting, not having to fight again. Um, so why do we tend to miss this now? It was actually only in the post-1945 period that, it, uh, that World War I came to be depicted primarily as a European conflict in comparison to the more devastating and all-pervading Second World War. Right, so that's the real referent for us today, Second World War, not First World War. But immediately following the First World War, the thinking was this was a global conflict. A glance at the numbers reveals some of the staggering, horrifically vast elements of the global scale and that are worth rehearsing here just at the beginning of our thinking about this today. World War I killed so many people, more than 9 million soldiers, sailors, and flyers and another five to seven million civilians that it led to what many contemporaries in the 20s termed the lost generation. This brought with it a level of personal trauma and devastation that can't adequately be conveyed by numbers, of course. Right? But one way of thinking about it is that roughly 11% of France's entire population was killed or wounded in the war. Something on the order of 10% of the people living on the planet in 1910 had died by 1980. Now, this includes the influenza epidemic and other factors, the Armenian genocide. But that's an enormous percentage. Think about how much that rate reshapes people and groups and life and ideology, much less state structures, war making power. Between 1914 and 1918, the war directly involved more countries, 28, and indirectly <coughs> involved 100 different countries and colonial regions from Africa, America, Asia, Australasia, Europe, uh, and elsewhere. One thing that we often don't think about is how many Africans, Indians, Japanese, and Vietnamese were fighting in the war. They're not often remembered in All Quiet on the Western Front, for example. Some of the classic films of World War I are almost exclusively the province of, of white historical actors and belligerents. And this is what a lot of the new historiography of World War I has come to show. How many other groups and peoples were really involved in the war? The war also cost a lot of money and a lot of material. Roughly 190 billion in direct costs and another 150 to 200 or more billion in indirect costs, which was more than any previous war in human history, bar none. So, despite the common perception that it was a war in which, t and despite the common perception that it was a war in which tactics did not change, it was also a war in which lots of strategic innovation happened, in which research and, and technology from around the world were deployed, actually quite adeptly, to kill and destroy. One evocative example. Uh, that I think Jake Hamlin may be talking a little bit about, uh, came in 1918. And it reveals how modern warfare adapted and dawned in all of its grisly, brutal glory using techniques adapted from around the world. The Germans developed a new horrific technique of bombardment, bombardment for their final attempts at uh, Kaiserschlacht, or Emperor's Battle, in the spring of 1918, the Somme and in Flanders, some of the most famous and horrific battles of the war. What did they do? Well, they fired shells containing both tear gas and lethal chlorine, and they did so in sequence. Why would they do that? This was a new development. They did that so the British would remove their gas masks, at which point they would be horribly scored, scarred by the chlorine. So after years of developing chemical warfare, adapting new techniques, 
and new ideas coming from other places. The, the newest murderous technology was in sequence use of these kinds of horrific weapons. So again, it's not as if tactics didn't change. They actually got worse. If you want to think about why people referred back to the war, why they still remember it in this sort of catastrophic way, globally, around the world. As Neil Hyman wrote in a book uh, called World War I, in fact, not physically hurt, but scarred nonetheless, were five million widowed women, nine million orphaned children, and 10 million individuals torn from their homes who became refugees. And none of this takes into account the Russian Civil War, the Third Balkan War, or back around to the influenza epidemic and other, and other uh, devastations like that. Right? So I'm just talking about the global consequences, the global shaping, the global trauma. So briefly then, what are we to make of this in terms of changing interpretations, the changing historiography? Well, for nearly a century, World War I was framed in terms, of course, of a system of international relations. How can you think of large-scale wars without the international relations? In which the national and the imperial levels of conflict and cooperation were taken as given. Right? So this is a history that was primarily written from different national perspectives. The recent, recent trend though, towards global history has influenced the perception and interpretation of World War I. Thus, the dominant understanding of the First World War as a major conflict of Western Europe from August 1914 to November 1918 has really lost its, its distinctiveness. It's been shifting away from the old stale debates about war guilt, for example, uh, and toward much more nuanced accounts, such as Christopher Clark's recent book, Sleepwalkers. It also now emphasizes other regions. One of them that's really important in understanding is the Eastern Front, right? We know a lot about the Western Front and have for a long time. Eastern Front has often been neglected, especially local and particular stories, towns of small groups. Uh, likewise, cutting edge global historical analysis is now uh, relativizing questions about the meaning of the war when looking at, for example, the involvement of the colonies or the expansionist politics and growth of Japan. So there are new histories of World War I that focus especially on Japan. Um, these newer transnational histories do not start with one state, for example and move on to others, but they take multiple levels of historical experience as givens, and they move on from there, levels at which uh, we can think about um, things below or above the national, uh, the national level. So let's take one, one example of that, one final example of that. Uh, the peace treaties following the war, which helped to reveal the transnational dynamics at play in the conflict. As Jay Winter has argued, the Paris peace demonstrates that the, that the war was, quote, both the apogee and the beginning of the end of imperial power, spanning and eroding national and imperial boundaries. Um, so Arez Manella's magisterial book on what he terms the Wilsonian moment epitomizes this trend, I would argue. He reconfigures the meaning of Versailles, the Versailles settlement by exploring its unintended consequences and in stimulating movements of national liberation. Where? Where what are the consequences globally? National liberation in places like Egypt, India, Korea, Vietnam, and China. World War I's impact on nationalist movements in those places, and you can track this to the individuals and the groups. You can track this to, to Gandhi, to Nehru, to Ri, to Ho Chi Minh, to Mao. These are people who are all thinking about what Woodrow Wilson referred to as, or who, what they thought he referred to as self-determination. And they reinterpreted it, and they adapted it to make claims about self-determination against their colonial power, who in turn did not provide the kinds of liberation that they had so hoped for at the Paris Peace Conference. So this is what the new global histories, the transnational histories look, look like. You don't need nation state actors to see that kind of analysis. I mean, who could have imagined, for example, that uh, the decision by those, those sort of great four figures of, of people like Wilson, of Lloyd George, of Clemenceau, of Orlando in Paris to give the Shandong province a place formerly held by Germany not to China, but to Japan, would have inspired large-scale riots in Beijing and contributed to the formation of the Chinese Communist Party. That was one of the consequences of World War I. So it was global. It probably had more far-reaching consequences than any other preceding war. Politically, it resulted in the downfall of four monarchies in Russia in 1917, in Austria-Hungary, in Germany in 1918, and in Turkey in 1922. It contributed to the Bolshevik rise to power in Russia in 1917. You could argue it contributed to the triumph of fascism in Italy in 1922. It ignited colonial revolts in the Middle East and across Southeast Asia. And the war brought vast social consequences, including the mass murder of Armenians and new ways of understanding genocide well before the Holocaust that we associate 
uh, genocide with in World War II. Economically, the war severely disrupted the European economies and their colonial trade routes. You cannot dissociate that disruption from the rise of the US as a world financial and, and commercial power. So this reshapes the place of the US in the world. We tend to think that that was something sort of steaming qua non of American power in the 20th century. Not so. World War I is the disruption that provides the room for the US to take that position in the global economy. So as many economists have explained, I would argue, few events better reveal the utter unpredictability of the future and the global orientations of even small things, like the murder of, a, of, a, of an heir uh, to an archduke's throne, um, than this event, than the World War II. At the dawn of the 20th century, most Europeans looked forward to a future of peace and prosperity. They weren't thinking the war was coming, necessarily, though they had these arcane alliances. <laughs> Europe had, fought a major, had not fought a major war for 100 years. Most political and military experts predicted any war wouldn't last long, given military technology. The exact opposite of how this played out. They were wrong, and their beliefs in the gifts of modernity and its relationship to human progress were therefore shattered in its wake. And they were shattered around the world, not just in Europe. Um, the war, in turn, left a worldwide legacy of bitterness, of loss, and of niches to be filled by new and different powers and groups that endures to this day in such symbols as a remembrance pop. Uh, <laughs>